On April 17, 1958, the Brussels World Expo officially opened with 54 countries and international organizations participating. The Soviet Pavilion and the U.S. Pavilion, adjacent to each other and of similar size, became the two largest and most attention-grabbing pavilions in the Expo. As early as October of the previous year, the Soviet Union had successfully launched the first artificial satellite. The Soviet Pavilion at the Brussels World Expo prominently showcased a replica of this remarkable achievement, positioning the model of the artificial satellite conspicuously in the exhibition hall. Simultaneously, the pavilion featured numerous high-tech achievements, including a model of the world's first nuclear power plant and an icebreaker powered by nuclear energy. In comparison, despite the United States successfully launching its first artificial satellite, Explorer 1, two months prior, its pavilion did not exhibit corresponding satellite technology or any high-tech products. Instead, the focus was on lifestyle, with daily fashion shows and a 360 degrees film titled Journey Through America playing on color television, presenting examples of the superiority of the American way of life. The Soviet Union represented technology, while the United States represented lifestyle. This seemed to be the prevailing sentiment among the majority of European residents after visiting the pavilions. However, a gap still existed in the Soviet Union's technological field, a gap that would evolve into a multi-billion dollar industry decades later, but was not as significant at the time as nuclear-powered satellites. In 1947, William Shockley, John Bardeen, and Walter Brattain successfully manufactured the first transistor at Bell Labs. In 1958, Texas Instruments engineer Jack Kilby invented the Integrated Circuit, IC, and Fairchild Semiconductor's Robert Noyce submitted a patent for the planar process, using aluminum as a conductive strip to manufacture integrated circuits. The invention of the transistor and integrated circuit cleared obstacles for the modern semiconductor industry. Silicon Valley in the San Francisco Bay Area began to take shape, attracting numerous technology talents interested in semiconductor development and becoming a global focal point. It was at this time that the Soviet Union, realizing the transformative impact of transistors on manufacturing, computing, and military capabilities, began constructing semiconductor factories nationwide. The Soviet semiconductor industry had the potential to leapfrog, much like nuclear weapons. This idea, once proposed, captured the attention of Soviet leaders, including Khrushchev. Although lacking technical expertise, they believed that Soviet scientists were no less capable than their American counterparts, and with more investment, surpassing the US was only a matter of time. Establishing a Soviet version of Silicon Valley became a Soviet goal. After careful consideration, the chosen location for the Soviet Silicon Valley was near Moscow, in a city called Zelenograd. With the foundation laid, the next question was what to produce. The Soviet Union lacked figures like Shockley or Kilby and could only continue along the path paved by the United States, in short, imitation. In 1963, the KGB established a new department, T Directorate, with T representing technology. Its sole mission was to acquire the latest scientific and technological knowledge from abroad. Under it, the X ray team, consisting of over 200 members, collaborated with intelligence agencies of socialist countries in Eastern Europe. Operating under the guise of various delegations, they obtained advanced technological intelligence from Western countries such as Europe and the United States. This copying strategy yielded decent results in the early stages. However, it lacked sustainability. While early-generation integrated circuits with simple structures could be replicated with dedicated effort, the exponential growth in the number of transistors on chips, driven by Moore's law, posed a challenge. By the time the Soviet Union spent a year or two perfecting the replication of a chip, chip companies in the United States had already released upgraded versions. As long as Silicon Valley kept advancing, chips produced in the Soviet Silicon Valley would forever lag behind by several years. Despite facing numerous challenges, the Soviet Union reluctantly continued the copying strategy to maintain the operation of semiconductor factories. In the early 1980s, the KGB employed around 1,000 people to gather foreign technology. Within the Soviet consulate in San Francisco, there was a team of 60 agents. They directly stole chips from technology companies in Silicon Valley or purchased them from the black market. For example, in 1982, one eyed Jack, arrested in California, was accused of concealing chips in his jacket and stealing them from Intel factories. 
the Soviet semiconductor industry ultimately did not achieve its own brilliance. This event triggered a series of chain reactions. In January 1982, Reagan signed an executive order that strengthened customs inspections of advanced technology and authorized the CIA to conduct counter-espionage operations against the Soviet Union in the technology sector. By 1985, the U.S. had seized goods worth about $600 million, leading to approximately 1,000 arrests. The subsequent explosion of the Siberian natural gas pipeline marked the end of the road for the Soviet semiconductor copying strategy. In early 1982, the Soviet Pan-Siberian natural gas pipeline, stretching 4,500 kilometers, entered the installation phase. The plan was to transport natural gas from the Siberian Urengoy field to western Ukraine. Due to the complex operation of the pipeline system, an automatic control software called SCADA was needed to control various valves and regulate gas flow. As the software from France and Germany was prohibited for export by the United States, the KGB's T-Directorate once again took action. They dispatched agents to infiltrate Canada and steal a set of SCADA software. However, the KGB did not anticipate that the software had already been tampered with. After a period of normal operation, the pipeline software program managing the operation of pumps, turbines, and valves reset the pump speed and valve operation parameters, generating pressure intensity beyond what the pipeline connections and welding could tolerate, wrote former U.S. intelligence member Thomas Reed in his memoir. In June 1982, shortly after the Pan-Siberian natural gas pipeline became operational, a massive explosion occurred due to the tampered SCADA software. The destructive force of the explosion was equivalent to 3,000 tons of TNT. This explosion not only cost the Soviet Union the opportunity to earn foreign exchange, but also dealt a severe blow to the domestic economy. It thrust the KGB's T-Directorate into the spotlight, raising suspicions about previously stolen technologies. Some projects were forcibly halted, leaving thousands of Soviet scientists anxious. Semiconductor development also came to a standstill. Adding to the woes, in November 1982, the United States and Europe reached an agreement to establish a joint technology coordination mechanism against the Soviet Union. In a unified action, nearly 150 Soviet technical spies were expelled. France alone expelled 47, most of whom were KGB T directorate members engaged in technology intelligence activities. This move effectively cut off the only source for acquiring advanced technology. Despite these adversities, scientists and technicians continued exploring various possibilities. In the early 1990s, Zelenograd's factories began developing 80,486 compatible machines using general logic arrays. After facing failure, they shifted to the development of field programmable gate arrays, KIF PGAs. The key electronic design automation, EDA, software, crucial to solving this problem, was also considered in Soviet plans and even entered the testing phase. Unfortunately, all these efforts dissipated with the dissolution of the Soviet Union in December 1991. The regrets regarding semiconductor development continued with its successor, Russia. Currently, Russia has two main wafer fabs, Micron and Angstrom. The former provides processing capabilities for 65 to 250 nanometer technology nodes, while the latter, restructured after bankruptcy in 2019, offers 90 to 250 nanometer technology nodes with an 8-inch wafer fab. Both companies primarily focus on products for military, aerospace, and industrial applications. Additionally, three significant chip design companies operate without wafer fabs, Baikal, Yadro, and MCST. Moscow Center of Spark Technologies, Baikal, Founded in 2012, is a subsidiary of the Russian supercomputing company T-Platforms. Its Baikal T1 processor, released in 2015, uses the MIPS P5600 Warrior architecture core. It integrates memory, storage, and bus controllers, with a power consumption of only 5W. Around 100,000 units were produced after mass production began in 2016 using TSMC's 28 nanometers process, marking a milestone in Russian chip design development. Unfortunately, it has been adversely affected by US sanctions, with few new processors launched after 2022, and its parent company T-Platforms declared bankruptcy in October 2022. MCST has a longer history, originating from the Soviet-era Lebedev Institute of Precision Mechanics and Computer Engineering, 
which participated in the development of the fourth-generation Soviet computer Elbrus I in 1971. MCST developed two microprocessors based on different instruction set architectures, ISA Elbrus and Spark. In 2014, they launched the Elbrus for S processor, Russia's first commercially available octa-core processor. However, the Elbrus processor also relies on TSMC for manufacturing and faces challenges in normal production due to sanctions. Despite not facing US sanctions, the Russian chip industry has struggled to grow into large-scale enterprises in harsh environments. Baikal is an example, and while MCST, as a government-backed entity, continues to introduce new products, it is unlikely to secure a significant position in the civilian market apart from military applications. Certainly, after experiencing the turbulence of the Soviet Union's dissolution, the fact that Russia has managed to preserve a few semiconductor companies is nothing short of a miracle. However, the efforts required for further semiconductor development in Russia are undoubtedly several times greater than those of other countries. Vasily Shpak, the Deputy Minister of Industry and Trade in Russia, pointed out during a media interview that in 2024, they will commence the production of 350 nanometers photolithography machines, followed by the launch of 130 nanometers process chip photolithography machines in 2026. Production will take place in existing factories in Moscow, Zelenograd, St. Petersburg, and Novosibirsk. Vasily Shpak summed up why Russia chose to manufacture photolithography machines with a simple statement, it's a straightforward logic, without semiconductor sovereignty, there is no technological sovereignty. Do you believe Russia can create its own chips? Share your thoughts in the comments, and we'll see you in the next video.